your name, O oh God. We praise you in the firmament of the sanctuary. We praise you even in and out of our prosperity. We praise you in the dance and we lift up holy hands. We'll praise you, God, in every circumstance. So I bless your name today, O oh God. I thank you for bringing me in front of this amazing congregation. This is, um, we, we call this friends and family day today. Friends and family, I don't want you, I don't want you to leave too quick because um, a Trini cooked last night. I say it again, a Trini cooked last night. And therefore, the food that's happening after this is beyond your imagination. There's, there's some roti down there and some, and some curry chicken. And as they, as they say in, in America, make you want to slap your mama. I ain't going to tell you who the chef is. I, I'm not going to tell it to you. But I know when I go downstairs, and my man Jerry over there, Jerry, Jerry's from Kuva. When Jerry eat my chicken, I, I mean the chicken of the, of, of, of the person who cooked it, Jerry's going to know there's a trinity in the house. Amen? Sister Amanda decided not to compete, and so she made, she made something else. Very well. I, 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 I recommended that highly of her. But the, there's some Trini food downstairs today. So please don't run out the door. You know, by, I, I, I'll give us another year, and I think we'll have, we'll have a 50-50 Trini Jamaican split in here. Small island, and I, I think we'll have to take all the small islands to compete with Jamaica. <laughs> but it's good to see everybody in the house. Pastor Kerr, good to see you, my brother. Minister, Chris, Minister Lindsay, it's good to see you, my brother. It's good to see you. Ranjay, I don't know, I don't know what happened to you uh, last week, boy. But what you were doing over there today, whew, somebody must have touched your fingers. I know if your wife kissed your hand last night. Fantastic, fantastic. Your wife is always on point, and we know this is your second instrument. We know you're a bass man. I know he's a fantastic bass man. But, but the Lord talked to your hands today on those keys today. Amen. Praise God. I'm very anxious to preach today. I, and for those who know me, I take my time. I'm very satirical. I take it easy. I thank God for my guests in the house, all these wonderful guests. Please stand up. Please, please stand up. The folks from Jaden Finch. Stand up for the Jaden Finch, Sister Chantel and Michelle. God bless you. To my deacon in the house, stand up. Stand up, Deacon Broomfield. God bless you. God bless you. We're going to fill you up. We're going to fill you up in a minute. Don't worry. We're going to fill you up in a minute. But uh, God bless everybody and to see everybody in the house of God today. And uh, I'm quite excited, like I said, to, to preach this particular word today. I was a little bit nervous. Um, yeah, I was a little bit. I'm, I was nervous. I, if, you, if you're not preparing a message and you're not nervous, it's not a good message. I was a little bit nervous, you know. We, we've got scholars in the house. Lindsay is a scholar. Lindsay, Lindsay, Lindsay lived with his Bible at all times. I know, I know you... You can't find Lindsay without a Bible in his hand. Sister Lindsay, is that true? Li, 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 that's right. Lindsay got, Lindsay got it. Digital, paper, scroll, tablet. Listen. Dictionary, concordance, Hebrew lexicon, all kind of thing you have. Praise the Lord. So I, I know, and, and, and Brother Cedric, I know too. He's, he's sitting there. Brother Cedric sends us more. He sends, he sends us all kind of stuff. He, he reading in Swahili, all kind of thing. Before we go any further, please put your hands together. Johnny, it's not church unless Johnny jumps off the speaker, for those who know. Johnny, Johnny is our, our relative acrobatic. Uh, that's right. Deacon in training. That's his daddy. All right. Praise the Lord. Please put your hands together for Pastor Thompson. There is not a lot of men who have been called to preach the gospel who give their pulpit so often to other people. And he is um, just a gentleman who has decided to offer his pulpit, not just to me, but to all of the other ministers here, to allow us to share our own individual gifts. And I believe it has made the church stronger. It's made, it's made me a better minister. I'm sure it's made a lot of you a better minister. So I'd like to thank you for the grace and the charity, the gift of charity that you have within you. Yes, you can clap for that. 
Pastors don't give up their pulpit. So I'm telling you, pastors don't give up their pulpit. And it shows a lot of humility that he allows us to come and to share and to preach. But I'm going to preach a word today. And uh, if you can stand up on your feet with me and turn to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke chapter 18. Uh, we're, 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 going to, we're going to speak of four things and then I'm going to take my seat. Uh, for those who've never seen me uh, preach before, I'm an expository preacher, which means I just preach what the Word has in front of me. And uh, when the Word is done, I'm done. And so we're in uh, verse 35 um, in the Gospel of Luke. And the four things that uh, you're going to see today is the issue. Say the issue. The crier. The crier. Say it again. The crier. The silencers. And Jesus the listener. Let's review for the class. She said I'm a Bible study teacher, so let me do Bible study today. The issue. The crier. The silencers. And Jesus the listener. Amen. You know where I'm going now, so you can follow easily. Here we go in the Gospel of Luke chapter 18 and verse 35. And it came to pass that as he was come near unto Jericho, a certain man sat by the wayside begging. Hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. And he cried, the crier, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him that he should not, that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood, other descriptions say, Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying, what will thou I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, receive thy sight. Thy faith, somebody say faith, has saved thee. And last verse, and immediately he received his sight and followed him glorifying God and all the people when they saw him gave praise unto God. Before you take your seat, just say to God, see me in the crowd. Take your seat in Jesus' name. Seeing me in the crowd. The issue. Pastor was talking today. And he was discussing the issue. I'm here to let you know that God is not moved by the issue. God is not moved whatsoever by the issue. I know, I know, you think to yourself, well, well, it, this, doesn't that defy certain things that we've read? But God is not moved by the issue. The issue is the vehicle that God is using to bring you into proximity of him. The issue is not what is catching God's attention because everyone has issues. Your issues, though you might not think so, are no bigger than anybody else's issue. And in fact, even if you have the biggest issue, it is not the issue itself that is grabbing the attention of God. In a place called South Africa, in August the 5th, 1962, a gentleman by the name of Nelson Mandela was arrested, charged, and convicted. His crime in apartheid South Africa was simple, that he was an organizer 
and that he utilized an inappropriate passport to leave the country. For those who don't understand, South Africa was a regime that was taken over by some Dutch settlers. These Dutch settlers, referred to as the Boer settlers, reclaimed Africa in that particular region and referred to themselves as Africanas. They then summarily put the indigenous African in a position where they took away their civil rights. They stopped them from movement, stopped them from functioning in government, stopped them from having the power of self-expression. They made sure they dominated their society and made sure they exclusified them to the point where they could not seek help. Nelson Mandela, one of the first major 20th century leaders of the party, the ANC, was trying to adopt the mentality that King had in America of a non-violent protest, a non-violent revolution to overthrow individuals who are set on oppression. Well, in March of 1960, they held a very non-violent uh, protest. And the Africanists decided that they were going to meet that protest with machine gun fire and mow down 69 Africans dead. Nelson realized that nonviolence was not going to work against that people, against that group. Now, Nelson wasn't an individual whose issue was unique. In the 1800s, the French Revolution began. The monarchy of France did not look at the common people as being actually human. They felt they were there simply to serve them. They were there to be taxed by them. They were there to work as they saw them to be work, as chattel, as indentured servitude. If they didn't have food, the famous quote from Maria Antoinette, the French queen said, let them eat cake. And therefore, the French middle class formed a party or an organization referred to as the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie made up of merchants and working class individuals who had built themselves up but who were not royalty decided that they were not going to allow themselves to be treated that way any longer. The same issue that they had in France is the same issue that they had in South Africa. I say it again, that God is not concerned with the issue. Nelson decided that he was going to go and find his way to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. He was going to look up our good friend Tafiri Makinin, Rastafari, the, the king of Ethiopia. He was going to seek out some help, but Tafiri Makinin himself was having trouble. The Italians had invaded Ethiopia, and Tafiri Makinin sought to go out to Europe and to beg the European, the British, to come and to bring troops to get the Italians out of Ethiopia. Well, they had some good old boys down there in Ethiopia who said, Tafari, while you're over there, we're going to do some things for ourselves. Bob Marley wrote a song about those young boys, called them Buffalo Soldiers. Those Ethiopian boys got up and decided that they were going to teach the Italians what it really meant to be warriors and sent the Italians packing to the point where Ethiopia was invaded, but it was never colonized. But that didn't help Mandela. Mandela, reaching out to, to, to China, reaching out to other countries in Africa, came back and the Africanists realized this guy is looking for help. And again, summarily, on August the 5th in 1962, they put him in jail. But he only had a a five-year sentence. Two and a half years into his sentence, realizing that it was time for parole. They said that the ANC has a more militaristic branch. And we see that you are not adopting the same thing that they're doing in America, but you guys are actually trying to fight. You're actually trying to fight back. And so 
they decided that not just Mandela, but seven other members of his party would have life imprisonment from five years to life. Mandela spent 27 years in prison until the clerk, through pressure, through revelation, through the power of God's influence, realized that a man should not be locked up because he was trying to fight against his oppressor. And Martin, sorry, Mal Mandela came out of prison in 1990. And immediately the ANC put him at the head of the table. And we know the rest. He became the president of South Africa. The thing about the issue is that ultimately God will find a way to bring that issue and cause you to bring yourself into his presence. Mandela went into jail a revolutionary, a man looking for blood. He came out of jail a diplomat, a man looking to balance his nation. Yes, he was ridiculed for giving back the country, but he went into jail one way and came out of jail another way. He went into jail a man ready for war and came out of jail a man ready for peace. I'm here to let you know that your issue will have an issue when Jesus mismeets your issue. Your issue will have an issue when Jesus meets your issue. That man crying on the road, a blind man sitting on the sideway of Jericho, his issue did not begin when Jesus started walking down the street. Many of you came into this church this morning with an issue. Your issue didn't begin when you sat down in these pews. Your issue didn't begin when I began to preach or when the worship team began to sing. Your issue began long before this. But in the mind of God, he knew how to fashion your issue like a vehicle. He knew how to cause your issue to bring you into this place today. He knew how to allow your issue to bring you into the dispensation of my voice today because the Spirit of God wants to have an incursion with your issue. Hallelujah. It's not about the issue. It's about you. It's not about the issue. It's about you. He's trying to get you in the proximity of his Jericho walk stroll. Hallelujah. He's, it's not the issue. The issue is not the problem. The issue is not what God is looking at. The issue is not what God is worrying about. God is worrying about you. Hallelujah. He's worrying about you. He'll send any issue to get to you. He'll send any issue to drive you here. He'll send any issue to break your spirit so that your spirit can be before him. He'll send any issue to tear down towers so that a nation can cry out to him. He'll send any issue to put you in slavery for 400 years so he can hear the cry of his people and answer. God uses issues. He uses issues because he doesn't want to lose you. He loses issues, uses issues because you are so important to him that he realizes that some men need a bigger issue to bring them to their knees. He is the God of the issue. Hallelujah. That God of the issue. But I'm here to let you know that if you've came here with an issue, your issue is in trouble this morning. Your issue is in trouble this morning if you follow some simple instructions. This blind man on that road had an issue and he didn't really understand what was going on he, he, the Bible says that he, he asks what does this mean and I pray today that you're asking that in your spirit regardless of how sophisticated you are what does it mean that Brereton is in here discussing an issue it means that God identified each and every one of you the minority report of each and every one of you is before the Lord today. And I say to you, your issue is before him today. Amen. He brought you here into this church today because you have an issue. You don't have to say amen, but you've got an issue. Amen. And he's saying that I want to let you know that I have an appointment date for your issue to be dismissed from your life. Now you can say amen. amen. 
sitting there, he was trying to figure out what does this mean? What, what is going on? What is, what, what, what is taking place? This man had two particular issues as we read. The one said he was blind and the second said he was begging. One said he was blind. Second said he was begging. Was his issue that he was broke, that he was poor, that he was destitute, that he was impoverished? Or was his issue that he was blind? Today, I have to put that before you too. Because each and every one of us has a dominant issue that is before you. The dominant issue before you is the issue that truly God has brought you here for. You might say, well, Bishop, there's, I've got more than one issue. He had more than one issue too. He could have asked for money. He could have asked for a place to sleep. He could have asked for a house to live in. But he understood his dominant issue. You see, sometimes time allows you to have the reflective moments of recognizing what brought you here. Sometimes you've needed to go through so many turns and, and tribulation moments to know what has actually brought you here. It works that way for a lot of men. Because the greatest thing that's keeping most of men, I'll talk about the men first, and ladies, I'll talk about you second, but most of it is taking, keeping us from, from God is pride. Pride is a tough thing. I'm an old non-church boy. I wasn't raised in church. I, I didn't grow up with a culture of church. I didn't have an idea that we had to come and to, and to abase ourselves and present ourselves before God. God had to find me in the world and bring me another way and let me reflect on what was my specific issue. That was my path. path. That was my vehicle. The question for yourselves today is what was yours? What is the issue on the table that has brought you to the place where you are? What is the issue that has taken you and caused your life to form its path to the place where you are sitting and saying, this is my moment, God? He was begging on Jericho, blind. We don't know his history, therefore you don't need to tell me yours. We don't have his criminal record, therefore you don't have to tell me yours. We don't know his mistakes, therefore you don't have to tell me yours. What we knew is that at the time when he meets God, he has a dominant issue. An issue that has arrived and an issue that he knows in a few moments, in the proximity of my voice, someone might be able to answer the issue. But while you are dealing with the issue, you are also dealing with the silencers. The silencers are the things that stop you from identifying and looking your issue in the face and saying, it's time to deal with it. The silencers can be outside or inside. We talked about pride. Pride many times is a silencer. Shame is also a silencer. Something that says, I, I, I don't want to admit it to anyone. I don't want to tell it to anybody. I don't want to confess it to anybody. I don't want to share it because I'm ashamed of it. Shame can keep you quiet when Jesus is about to walk by. When deliverance is in your reach, shame can keep you in a place where you don't reach out. Shame, shame is a silencer. Pride is a silencer. The cares of this world are also silencers. You, you've heard it said, and many of you have said it before, it is what it is. That, that, that particular statement, that particular disabling statement, is many times a statement that causes people not to self-correct or to even accept any accountability or responsibility for what is about to happen or what could change. Oh, well, it is what it is. He could have sat there blind and begging and heard, yeah, there's a prophet going by. Well, that's not going to help me. It is what it is. Right now, I need some money. Right now, I need, I need, I need somebody to, to take me into their house. Right now, I need somebody to lead me by the hand. It is what it is. It is what it is are the cares of this world and the cares of things that you think are bigger or outside of what God can do. I don't know anything bigger than God. I don't know anything outside of what God can do. 
you think that, you know what, that's not one of these things I'm going to take to the pastor. That's, that's not one of these things I'm going to pray about. I'm, I've got to find a way to figure this thing out. Oh, this is the second one. I've got to do what I've got to do. I've got to do what I've got to do. But what you have done has brought you the issue. The silencers, the silencers, the silencers. And then the silencers that come from without. Because many of us, we seek bad counsel. We absolutely seek bad counsel. You say, how, how do you know that? Because most of you don't try to seek and wait for the counsel and the answer of God first. We seek the arm of flesh before we seek the word of God. Oh man, you do it all the time. I don't care how pious you are. I don't care how pious you are. Many times you will get on your knees and you will pray and you'll say, God, I need this. And then you'll say, you know what? Let me call my friend. Right? Right away. You'll pray about it, but then you'll say, let me call my friend. You haven't given God five seconds to answer you. Because we lean so heavily on the arm of flesh. We are substantive substance beings. We are tangible carbon creations living in a tangible realm. So it is easy and almost reactive for us to lean on flesh things. So many of us seek bad counsel. But just because you seek bad counsel doesn't mean you always have to take bad counsel. Uh, the, we spoke about it on Thursday. The guide of the Holy Spirit is to be able to give you the discernment to understand that when certain information, when certain counsel comes your way, you should be able to say, mm, I think I'm going to reject that one. I, I, that one doesn't feel like God to me. That one doesn't feel like the way that God is trying to take me. I don't care if you're five years old. I don't care if you're young. I don't care if you're mature. I don't care if you do not know Scripture very well. The Holy Spirit can still lead you. Amen. Can still lead. You have to know how to understand the still small voice. It begins in a weird way for most of us. Most of us understanding when the Holy Spirit talks of us is something very simple. It's like, I think it's going to rain today. Should I bring an umbrella? I wonder if I should wear this coat. I, I wonder if I should take this, this way to school I, I, or drive this way to work. And after you get outside or you decide to do what you decide to do and you get outside and you say, you know what, I should have listened to myself. 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 You weren't talking to you. God was trying to teach you how to hear him, even in the still small voice of the everyday things of your life. But we have to learn how to hear from him and how to listen to him. We have to hear how to respond to him. So the Holy Spirit does allow even outside counsel to come and to bring us outside counsel and to say, this one, that's not from God. He teaches us how to hear and how to discern and how to eliminate. Then you have the last silencer. Satan is a silencer. Satan is absolutely a silencer, but he silences you different. He has really only one true trick. We saw him in the garden. He brings us before the word of God and the instructions of God himself, and he changes it a little bit. He gives you a little bit of pride in it. You're a man of God. Why do you have to go and sit down and listen to them? Uh, why, do they think, why, do you, why do they think they have ownership or rulership over you? You're a mighty man of God. Why don't you seek counsel from yourself? You know what? You should look into you and it becomes a conversation about you and not a conversation about God. Amen. Satan is a silencer because he tries to turn you into your own God. He tries to turn your opinion into divine information. He tries to turn your fleshly whims into the will of God. God knows my heart. Satan is a silencer because even for the very elect, they would be fooled 
if he did not shorten the age. Satan is a silencer. He doesn't want you to come to church. He doesn't want you to forgive. He doesn't want you to tithe. He doesn't want you to invest in reading, in inspiration, in prayer, in fasting. Satan is a silencer. Amen. Amen. He doesn't want you to care about the things God wants you to care about. He wants you to be hardened. He, he wants you to see your friend as your enemy. He wants you to hate your enemy even, where God has empowered you to love your enemy. Satan is a silencer. He will keep you out of the pathway of the God who's trying to reach you in your issue. But what do you do when the silencer comes? They said when they tried to silence him, he cried out all the more. He cried out all the more. I can imagine Mandela sitting in that jail cell for 27 years. I can imagine the things that were going through his mind. I can imagine him giving up on what was his purpose in life. Hallelujah. But you know, sometimes the criers are individuals who are also supporting you. God, just give this to me. Sometimes you can't even cry for yourself. But you need some people to be a crier for you. Sometimes you need an intercessor. You need somebody when you are immobile and unable to, to, to lift you up and carry you up that wall and to rip the roof off and to, and to lower you down so Jesus can actually heal you. Sometimes you need a help me to cry out for you. You need your friends to cry out. You need, you need your people to cry out. I remember there was a man who wrote a song. It was free, free Mandela. Free Nelson Mandela. They were trying to free Mandela in, in Africa. They were trying to free Mandela in the Caribbean. They began to try to free Mandela in Europe. All over the world they were trying to free Mandela. I believe that when Mandela was sitting in that jail cell as a revolutionary, sitting in that jail cell with a mind ready to kill everything that is Africanus, he heard the cries of others and it changed his heart. He heard the cries of others and it affected who he was as a man. He, in, in fact, I believe they cried louder about the Mandela that he needed to be than about the Mandela that he used to be. Somebody say, cry out even the more. The first cry he said that, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. When he cried, Jesus, son of David, I believe that meant something specific. Jesus, son of David, was identifying the life of Jesus of Nazareth himself. Jesus, a man of obscurity, a man who never traveled more than 40 kilometers from his own home. A man who was not known in India, was not known in Asia. A man who, who they didn't even realize who his true father or his true nature was. Israel didn't know who Jesus was. Israel was, 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 was uh, uh, oblivious to the true nature and the true power that who was there. The manifest presence of God, the I am was walking amongst them and they didn't know who he was. The most they saw was a prophet. And so we look at that Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. They try to silence him. But then he said something different if you look at the scripture. Just a strange and small nuance of change. He said, son of David, have mercy on me. First he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But the next time he says, son of David, have mercy on me. The first time Jesus doesn't hear him. The first time Jesus doesn't stop. Not that he uses the wrong term. Not that the proximity has an issue because we know he's the omniscient God in Christ. But the second time, son of David, have mercy on me. And the Bible says, and Jesus stood still. 
The second time he cries out, he is not simply crying out to the human in Nazareth. He's not just crying out to the manifestation that is before him. The second time he's crying out, he's speaking to the very prophetic nature of who Christ is. He's speaking to the David. He's speaking to the David, the same David, that when they came to anoint a king, hallelujah, David was nowhere to be seen because Jesse hadn't even considered him a son. They anointed all of Jesse's son, tried to anoint all of Jesse's son, and the Bible says the oil would not pour. They, they said, there must be someone else. There must be a, a, an anointed one. There, there, there must be one who has been specifically called for this. And, and so they called out, listen, is there another? And, and, and Jesse says, yes, I, I, I have one more son. I have one more son. I have one more obscure individual. I have one more individual that you don't see in the crowd. I, I, have, I have one more person that, that has been overlooked. There, there, are you the individual in your life who feels that you have been overlooked in the crowd? Hallelujah. You've not been seen in the crowd. You, 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 your skills and your gifts and your abilities and you say, God, why me? And, and God, I, I've done all this. How come nobody sees what I can do, what I can bring to the table? But, but have they been crying out and you have not been seen in the crowd? I believe Joseph was one of those individuals. I believe Joseph was a man similar to that. His father even didn't know truly who he was. His brothers didn't know truly who he was. But, 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 but David was even worse. David, even after he was anointed king, they didn't know. They didn't know he was king. They didn't know who he was supposed to be. Until he comes into his Goliath moment. He starts talking about Goliath. He starts saying things about Goliath. He starts whispering to other people about Goliath. But until he kills his Goliath, nobody knows who he is. I believe that blind man on the side of the road woke up even the giant killer in Christ. Woke up the prophetic calling of his life. Woke up everything that demonstrated that you must be seen in a crowd. Woke up that there's a call and a cry that God hears. I, I'm here. It's like it's like mothers have a baby and 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 there's there's a there's a cry that sometimes they fall down and you're like oh I heard the baby but there's a cry ow and you say you know uh -uh, that cry something's wrong. There's a cry. There's a frequency that I believe God hears. There's, there, there's, a, there's a level to reach him. There's, there's an amplification. There is something that connects with God that he says, now you're not just calling out your issue. Now you're just not opening up your mouth, but you're speaking to who I am in the name of Jesus. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stops. It's, it causes him to stand still. It causes him to freeze. He says, there's something about this blind man that sees who I am. The blind man begging sees Christ more clearer than everyone else. Everyone is groping. Everyone is pulling. But he sees destiny. Everyone is trying to get what they can get. But he sees prophetic fulfillment. Everyone is trying to access their miracle. But he sees who Christ truly is. Son of David, have mercy on me. Somebody needs to speak to their issue and tell their issue that I've got someone that when I cry out to him, oh, you're going to run out of here, baby. I've got someone that when I open up my mouth, he will hear me and answer me. I've got someone. Somebody begin to speak to your issue because your issue came to church with you this morning. I, when I call out the name of Jesus, mercy, mercy is going to break out all over me. Mercy is going to break out in this house. When I call out the name of Jesus, Jesus stood still and Jesus said, bring him to me. This is an interesting revelation that there is a time when your cry brings you to the place and the proximity of where the Lord is listening. The worst thing to do or the worst place to be is a place where God is listening and you're not talking. God is listening and you're not talking. You know what that place is called? Church. Where God is listening and you're not talking. Where God is listening and you're not sending out your petition. Where God is listening and you're not sending out praise. 
This is the end of our praise month, right? Praise is the weapon. What do you think those cries are? Those are cries of praise. Praise is his weapon. Crying out. There's a powerful thing to be said when you are in the proximity of God and you are not speaking. When he has said that the floor is yours, tell me what I need to do for you. Speak to me and I will answer. Knock and the door shall be open. Come on. There's a moment when you step into the presence of God where it's not good to be quiet. He brings him in. He brings him in and says, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. This is your time. It doesn't matter how small the issue you have this morning is. It doesn't matter if you're a 13-year-old boy and you drove in here on a scooter. It doesn't matter if you're a 40-year-old man and you drove in here on an SUV. God is ready to listen to your issue. It doesn't matter if you flow all the way from Trinidad and Tobago or from the Philippines. God is ready to listen to your issue. This is not the time to be quiet. It doesn't matter if there's cancer in your body or you owe $5.99 to the post office. It's time to put your issue before God. What is your issue? He asked him. What is, what will thou, shall I do unto thee? And he says, Lord, that I might receive my sight. That I might, that I may receive my sight. Hallelujah. You see, this is the moment where you put faith in front of the issue. That man, a blind man, sees Jesus and sees sight. You, you missed it if you missed it. He's a blind man that can see who Jesus is. And he can see sight for himself. Oh, that's some faith, baby. That's some faith, baby. What can you see for yourself? What can you... Uh, uh, there's some blind people in here. Faith is of things hoped for. The evidence of things... Oh, I wish you were like the blind man this morning. There's a blind man that can see Christ and see sight for himself. You need to speak like that blind man on Jericho today and be able to speak for yourself. Come on, church, stand up on your feet. What shall I do for you today? We're going home right now. And Jesus said unto him, Hallelujah. What shall I do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Before I finish this scripture, begin to open up your mouth and tell God your issue and what you need today. Oh, if you're ashamed of it, that's your business because shame is a silencer. If you've got pride today, that's a, that's a terrible thing. Because pride is a silencer. If the enemy is telling you, don't be listening to Brereton, he's just trying to make you, he's just trying to do things for himself to make himself look good, that's a shame. Because Satan is a silencer. Whew. But if you really got somebody who really can't open up their mouth, who really can't give God the instructions that they need, oh, just slip your hand into their hand. And say, don't worry, baby, I'm going to cry out for you. I'm going to cry out and let God know what you need and I need. Because I won't be silent. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Woo! Before I finish this, just begin to open up your mouth. You can whisper it like Hannah used to whisper in the presence of Eli. You can shabak it like this man was shabaking on Jericho's wall. All oh, musicians, that you would lift up a noise that God would travel in this praise. In the name of Jesus, speak your issue out loud. Voice your issue to the heavenlies. Jesus is in your midst today. Your issue has brought you here. Your issue has driven you here. But your faith will answer for you. In the name of Jesus, God, before I read the rest of this, hear the cry of your people. For you have said in the four times that I have heard the cry of my people Israel and what their taskmasters have done. I have felt their sorrow. Oh, Lord of sorrows, 
hear the cry of your people this morning hear the cry of your children this morning they cry out to you from their issue they cry out to you from their pain they cry out to you from their sorrow they cry out to you oh God from their handicap they cry out to you from their diseases they cry out to you from their broken hearts be the God that sees us in the midst of the crowd be the God that sees us in the midst of the crowd Lord I know you can see me you are Yahweh El Roy the God that sees see me oh God the Bible says your eyes go to and fro throughout the earth to see whose mind is stayed upon you oh God hear the cry of your people this morning and Jesus said to him and I say to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ receive thy issue thy faith has saved thee receive thy sight receive thy open door receive thy breakthrough receive thy open heaven receive your deliverance you shall not see your oppressor again you shall not see this calamity again I live under the faith of the God of the immediately he said immediately God in the name of Jesus hear the petition of your people we need an immediate answer we need an immediate breakthrough we need an immediate turnaround God we're not looking for 24 hours this time but we're looking for a right now answer oh God we don't know what's going to meet us when we walk out that door so we need an immediate answer in the name of Jesus receive thy sight thy faith has made thee thy faith has saved thee thy faith has saved thee oh can somebody declare it my faith has saved me my faith has saved me and immediately and immediately somebody says and immediately come out of that pew and walk by this altar and say and immediately and immediately if you believe God has changed it if you believe God has changed it turn this altar into your Jericho into your Jericho wall into your Jericho street and immediately and immediately and immediately father and immediately answer mine and answer theirs and immediately hold not back your hand oh God and immediately hallelujah and immediately and immediately come on church come on church don't be silent he is in the building don't be quiet he is at an earshot away son of David have mercy on me have mercy on me I'm not asking for much you've seen how long I've been sitting here God you've seen how long we've been here you've been seen how long we've been suffering you've seen how long they've told us to eat cake and not have bread you've seen how long they've told us that we were second-class citizens You've seen how long they've been dragging our name. You've seen how long they've kept me from my children. You've seen how long they've kept me from my money. Kept me from my home. Oh God, cry out, cry out, cry out. And immediately, and immediately. He received his sight and followed him glorifying glorifying is there any glory in this house today glorifying God and all the people when they saw it and all the people when they saw it and all the people when they saw it gave praise gave praise gave praise unto God don't forget like comment 
subscribe as we share the word of God through Emmanuel Church of Jesus Christ.